Welcome to First Church. We are Open Table, a small group that focuses on LGBTQIA-centered voices and stories with a Christian lens. We hope you feel welcome this morning and loved on, and please stop by and say hi to any one of us at any point throughout the service. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Good morning. Welcome to First Church's virtual worship stream. My name is Katherine Mullen. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as the Minister of Community Engagement here at First Church. We are delighted to have you worshiping with us this morning virtually, uh, and I have some announcements that I'd like to share with you before we get started. Our first announcement is about our church-wide pool party on June 14th. Join us for a super fun pool party on June 14th at the West Homewood Pool. We'll start splashing around 6.15 p.m. Bring your swimsuits and your towels and come on out and join us for a really fun pool party. This is our way of ending a really fun week of gross out camp with our city kids, but the pool party itself is church-wide, which means all ages are welcome. So please come on out and join us for that party on Friday, June 14th. Our next announcement is about arts camp, which begins July 15th. During arts camp, students will explore how they can be heroes in their everyday lives. We'll learn through crafts, science, song, dance, recreation, games, and more. Our heroes will dive into the following themes. Heroes are called to follow Jesus. Heroes are called to help others. Heroes are to work together. And heroes are called to show grace. We are excited to offer arts camp at a rate of $40 per camper, which includes lunch and a morning snack. An extended care option is available for $35 per camper, and it will, it will run until 4 p.m. each day. An afternoon snack will be provided for those in aftercare. So again, the highlights, arts camp will be super fun as it always is. It begins Monday, July 15th and runs through that Thursday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. that day, every day. Uh, and we really hope that your child has signed up to attend. And if you have teenagers or students that would love to volunteer, we would love to have them join us for that week. And if you yourself find yourself unoccupied that week in July, come join us for a really fun, very special week at Arts Camp. Our next announcement is about Mom's Night Outs this summer. Join our First Church moms for a night out this summer. These nights are a great way to connect with other parents here at First Church. And we have two moms night outs this summer. On June 13th, they're meeting at Slice Pizza in Lakeview at 7 p.m. And on July 11th, they're meeting at Moe's in Vestavia at 7 p.m. If you have any questions about these nights out, you can email Ashley at firstchurchbhm.com and she'll connect you with our volunteers that lead these mom nights out. Moms night outs, it's a tongue twister. Our last announcement is about combined Sunday school this summer. We are combining our Sunday school classes three times this summer. On June 23rd and then again on August 11th, our Justice and Mercy team will lead information sessions featuring our different community partners. Come learn more about our relationship with each of these partners and how might you could be involved if you so want to. On July 14th, Separately, members of our congregation will present on their experiences and a once in a lifetime trip to Greece that they took um, on a spiritual pilgrimage. They'll share stories, photos, reflections, and takeaways from this amazing trip um, that you won't want to miss out on. Renee Harmon, Justin and Maggie Banger, and Gladys Schaefer will all, are all First Church folks that attended this spiritual pilgrimage and they have a lot of stories to share. And from the photos that I've seen, I am just really excited to learn more. So I hope you will join us for that presentation on July 14th, as well as the other presentations our Justice and Mercy team is sharing with our Sunday school classes on those other days. 
So friends, with all these announcements shared, there's clearly a lot happening here at First Church and a lot of opportunities to get involved and to get plugged in. So with all these announcements shared, uh, we invite you to greet each other in the comments, say good morning, uh, say hello, and prepare your heart and your mind for worship with us today. to see them lived out. Forgive us when we are anything but authentic. Forgive us when we just want to be with our people and not inclusive of others. Forgive us when we feel doing justice asks too much of us. Forgive us when diversity feels a burden and not a gift. Forgive us when we are not hospitable to the stranger or the friend. Forgive us when we seek easy answers instead of embracing tough questions. We need your grace, loving God. And so together we pray, forgive us and renew a right spirit within us. Though we may be imperfect, God's love is perfection and never wavering, God is ever ready to reconcile and make what we are finally willing to release. Hear the good news. 
You are forgiven. We are forgiven. Thanks be to God. This morning, as we are in the midst of pride and we are focusing on the priority of creating inclusive community, I'm sharing a Prayers of the People, written by M. Jade Kaiser, who is a member of the LGBTQ community and a writer for Enfleshed, which is an online collection of resources made by and for the celebration of queer people in the church. Will you pray with me this morning? In the midst of all that keeps our spirits frantic, overwhelmed or troubled, we pause. We pause to remember each other as those whose precious and precarious lives are inherently bound together. We pause to remember the basic gifts of water, of trees, of beauty, of the land we gather upon. We pause to remember our neighbors, distant and near, and so to the one who is love. We bring the prayers of our communities, where we share in our joy or concern, I invite you to respond with me if you would choose. God, hear our prayers. And so we pray. For all the queer, trans, and intersex children and youth across the globe, for the ones who are struggling with feelings of isolation and shame, for those who have no safe place or people to retreat to, for those who must be teachers to the adults in their lives, for those who are unsafe in their communities. God, hear our prayers. We pray for our elders whose labor we are indebted to, for the ones who never tasted the freedom they fought for, for the ones who were forced to the fringes of their own movements, for the allies who suffered beside us, casting their lot in true solidarity, for the ones forgotten and betrayed. God, hear our prayers. We pray for all those who hunger for justice and liberation today, for the ones who lay down their lives for their friends, for the ones who tell the truth, for the ones who take risks, who dream, who feed and pray, who fight for bread and roses both, for the ones who are eager to learn and grow and offer their gifts to the work of enfleshing your dreams. God, hear our prayers. We pray for all who are suffering in the church and the world at the hands of white supremacy, for those imprisoned by the state, for those whose land has been taken, for the earth that groans beneath us, for those without food or housing, for those who have yet to repent. God, hear our prayers. We pray in gratitude for all that nourishes and sustains us, for the gifts of beauty and friendship, shared meals and art and love, for laughter, for pleasure, for the friends, lovers, and comrades who lift our spirits always by our sides when the days are heavy, for the freedom we have in Christ. God, hear our prayers. For your presence within and around us in our highs and lows, our hope and our despair. God, we give you thanks. Hear our prayers and deepen our willingness to show up with and for one another. And God, even when we aren't sure what else to pray, remind us of the prayer you taught us by saying, Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before I spoke a word, you were singing
was your foe, still you from Ruth chapter 1 verses 1 through 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Shilion. And they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and they remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Milan and Shilion also died. 
so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from a country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and had given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to your own mother's house. May the Lord deal with you kindly, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Will you, why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they're grown? Would you refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you, to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. When you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do thus to me, and more as well, even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Dear church family, as we turn our hearts to our call for offertory, I want to tell you what drew me to this church. I've not always been on staff. I joined this church as a member and fell in love with this church as a visitor. From the first moment I walked in, I knew that this was a place that was going to love me and nurture me. Church, I am married to a female and I am in love with a female and really don't know a day without being gay, honestly. And First Church has loved me, and they have poured their lives into me, and they've allowed me to minister and come on staff, and they love people so well. Church family, when you give your tithes and offering, you're reaching a community that is marginalized, that has suffered, that, is, that has had much harm. You are doing something great every time you put money into this plate, the plate that passes or you give online. Because First Church reinvests that into our community, reinvests it into the lives of our community who identify as LGBTQ. We do things like BOA bingo. We march in the pride parade. Uh, and we just make a space here in our own church for queer people to come together and talk. Places like open table and discussions around the table. You do an amazing job of giving. And because you give, people like myself can feel themselves, can feel whole and worthy of God's love. So I thank you. And as you give, would you give with that in mind this morning?
Good morning. My name is Jonathan Goss, and I have the privilege of serving here at First Church as the associate pastor, and I use he, him pronouns, and it's good to be with you all today in worship. Today we are continuing our sermon series, Imagine. In this series, we are spending time each week reflecting on First Church's priorities, how they ground us in scripture and ground us in life, and how we might represent and embody each of them. Different artists within our congregation have been asked to create art that represents the individual's priorities that we hold together so that we might imagine expansive ways we can understand each priority. This series is truly a piece of art by you, the First Church family and our congregation. Each week we are reflecting on one of our priorities. This week we are leaning into the theme of inclusive community, creating an inclusive community. Today I'd like to highlight the artwork by Renee Harmon, whose piece is titled The Weaver. This is hanging in our education building. I want to read a little bit about what Renee writes you all to ponder as you view her piece of art. What is the warp that is holding this tapestry together? How do I fit in this tapestry? What does the loose thread symbolize? And why does this tapestry hold together in the end? I'm gonna show Renee's piece of art right now. I'm gonna read a little bit that she has written about her art. It's titled The Weaver. She sits at the loom, pondering her next thread. Her loom of the world, creating a structure of earth and sky and sea. She has already woven in some flowers, feathers, fins, and fur. Her cloth is colorful, but she feels it lacks soul. There is no depth, no music, no dance to it. She selects a deep mahogany colored yarn and weaves it into the next row. Then in a rush, because she can imagine the creation that is taking shape, she adds strands of peach, olive, and gold. Here, a newly spun yarn. Already she senses a new depth of the tapestry emerge. Next, an older thread that is a bit worn. There is vibrant and flamboyant colors. Some individual pieces of yarn are starting to unravel, but being held tightly in the cloth, they contribute to the whole as well. The weaver completes her tapestry, removes it from the loom and holds it at arm's length. The whole of her creation is beautiful to her. She remembers each thread that she has selected and woven into her masterpiece. She breathes a prayer into each piece of yarn as she adds it, reminding each strand that she has chosen them and that they are beautiful. The continuous strand runs back and forth through the warp. The weaver murmurs as she weaves, you are more stunning when you are next to those unlike you, you are all part of the whole. The, re the weaver removes the tapestry from the loom again and hangs it among the stars, marveling at what she has created. She saw it and it was good. That's excerpts from what Renee has written about her piece, The Weaver. I encourage you to go and walk through our education building and see each beautiful created piece of art. Today, you all have heard Ashley read from our text, Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. The story of Ruth is a brilliant work a theological art. It invites us to reflect on the question of how God is asking us, calling us, heeding us to create 
an inclusive community. The three main characters in this book are Naomi, the widow, Ruth, the Moabite, and later on in the story, Boaz, the Israelite farmer. Their story is told in four chapters that are beautifully designed. The story of Ruth, Naomi, and Boaz is one of my favorite stories in our holy and sacred text. Around 14 years ago, in one of Stephanie Arnold, our senior minister, her first sermon series here at First Church, she preached on this text. And in this series, she titled it, If My Memory Serves Me Right, Reclaiming Ruth. It became one of my favorite stories in this, in this series because of how Stephanie taught it and preached it and how meaningful that time was some 14 or so years ago. To me, this story is one of choosing to include, choosing not to leave someone behind, choosing someone, all of them, each piece of thread and yarn of them, not parts of them, but all of them, the whole of them. Ruth's words to Naomi resonate with me today as they did some 14 years ago. Do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. This short story is a brilliant work of theological art. It invites us to question who is God calling us to include? How is God calling us to create belonging, to create an inclusive community, and to always, always, always choose people over hardships, over rules, and over institutions? The story of Ruth is good news. It is good news to all. Because good news is only good news when it's good to everyone. And God knows that the church universal has not figured this out yet. In the history of the church, people have been excluded. They have been not welcomed. They've been told you're not invited because of their race, because of their gender, because of their sexual orientation, and because of their identity. Yet, Friends, the good news is First Church states overtly, directly, that all are welcome. And all means all. This is why we last night marched in the Pride Parade and had a wonderful time showing the city of Birmingham that God is love and that you are included. This is why for so many years and decades, First Church has, has stood for the voiceless, has fought for the rights of LGBTQIA plus folks to be married in sacred and holy spaces like the sanctuary I stand in this morning, to be ordained in holy spaces like this, to be fully seen and represented in our United Methodist denomination. Friends, this is why, this is why our thesis, our plumb line, the foundation of our faith is that God is love. And we believe that, that love, that love is the most powerful element in our wild, vast, and chaotic universe. We see the theme of inclusivity in the story of Ruth. There are those three main characters, Naomi the widow, Ruth the Moabite, and Bo Boaz the Israelite farmer. The story unfolds over four chapters, and they are all beautifully designed. So we're going to look at the text that Ashley read. Chapter one opens up with the line, in the day when the judges ruled. This reminds us of the dark and difficult times from the book of Judges we find an Israelite family in Bethlehem. Elamech, Naomi, and their sons, Milon and Kelon, 
struggling to survive through the hardship of the famine. In search of food, they moved to the land of Moab, Israel's ancient enemy, Moab. There, the father, Elamech, he dies, and the sons marry Moabite women, Ruth and Orpha. The sons soon follow after their father, and they die as well. This leaving Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpha, with no reason to stay together, Naomi tells her daughters-in-laws that she's moving back to her homeland. She knows that life of an unmarried foreign widow in Israel is going to be hard. She does not want those hardships for her daughters-in-laws. So she compels them to, to leave her, to stay behind, that she will go alone. Now, Naomi being unmarried, being a widow, means that she will be among the most marginalized in her society. In this culture, she had lost all of her value. She was no longer a mother. She was no longer a wife. She would be deemed worthless. She would be told time and time again, you are not included because you have no value. Orpha obliges her mother-in-law and leaves. But Ruth shows remarkable loyalty to Naomi, saying, where you go, I go. Your people are now my people, and your God is my God. In this choosing to include Naomi in her own life, Ruth states, you have value, you are worthy, you are good, you are beloved. The two of them return to Israel and the chapters following include Naomi changing her name to Mara, which means bitter, as she laments the tragic fate of her life. If you fast forward to chapter four, things all come together. Remember Boaz, the Israelite far or the, uh, yes, the farmer that I mentioned earlier, it turns out that there is a closer family member than Boaz who was interested in redeeming the family to making them whole again. But at the last minute, he finds out he has to marry Ruth, the Moabite, and he declines. Yet Boaz, Boaz knows Ruth's true character through this story. And he acquires the family property of Naomi's husband and marries Ruth. Just as Ruth included Naomi, just as Ruth was loyal to Naomi and did not leave her, Boaz does the same. The story concludes with a total reversal of all the tragedies. In Ruth chapter 4, we receive these words. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her bore a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without next of kin and may his name be renowned in all of Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who loves you, who loves you, who is more than you than seven sons, has bore him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He became the father of Jesse, the father of David. Ruth, out of her love and willingness to include Naomi in her life, and in turn, Boaz choosing to include Ruth in his life. Through that act of including, belonging, loving, we receive the genealogy of King David, and thus the genealogy of Jesus. Ruth is included. 
Naomi is included in the genealogy of Jesus. We would not celebrate this story were it not for Ruth's decision to create inclusive community that leads to life and the ministry and the resurrection of Jesus the Christ. That is good news. This morning, I want to share a couple of stories with you all. I think from early childhood, any of us can think of a story when you were not included. I grew up in the community of Lake Wildwood in Macon, Georgia. I had an amazing childhood. I lived at 1080 Wallahia Trail in Lake Wildwood, and my street included so many friends from my childhood. Jesse and Lance, Derek and Mara, Max, Sid, Alan, Brandy, Another Alan, Eric, Andrew, Kyle, Davey, Carl, Jeremy, and Justin, to name many of my childhood friends. We would have massive kickball games or football games in people's front yards. We'd play hide-and-go-seek. We invented a game called The Fugitive based off the movie starring Harrison Ford, The Fugitive, where one person would run out in our neighborhood and hide, and everyone would go and look for that one person. It was the best of childhoods. Yet, there were times where I didn't feel included. I mentioned Brandy, one of my neighbors. She lived not directly across the street from me, but one house across the street from me. She lived right next door to Sid. Brandy, in sixth grade, had a birthday party. Now, I need to give you some context for this story. Brandy and I did not always see eye to eye. I think I annoyed Brandy and Brandy annoyed me and we had this understanding that we didn't always see eye to eye but we would hang out and we would play games in the neighborhood. Well something happened. I don't even remember what happened but I I made Brandy mad. I upset Brandy. I probably said something that hurt Brandy's feelings. Okay I'm gonna be honest. In turn Brandy for her sixth grade birthday party invited our whole sixth grade class to her birthday, except for me. And here I'm thinking, um, I've got best friends, Kyle and Derek in particular. We were best friends since third grade. I'm like, they're my boys, they're my guys. They're not gonna go to Brandy's party. They're gonna hang out with me on the day of her party, which was a Friday. So I go to them, I'm like, hey guys, look, Brandy invited everybody to her birthday party except for me. Y'all aren't gonna go, y'all are gonna hang with me in solidarity, right? Wrong. Uh, they definitely went to the party because, in their words, Jonathan, all the pretty girls are going to be at the party, so we're going to the party. Um, I can remember that day, sitting in my living room, looking through the blinds out of the window of my house across the street and seeing kids playing and having fun at Brandy's birthday party. I felt left out, I felt excluded, I felt uninvited. Again, we all have those experiences from our childhood. And unfortunately, children still today have those experiences. I think adults do too. You see, there are times in our lives when we all feel excluded. Exclusion is a universal experience. As I was preparing for the sermon, I was telling Amy about these ideas and she asked me a question. She said, you know, I think it's easy to tell a story from your childhood, but what, where's a place you, you feel some level of exclusion? And I need to name up front, like I, I love my life. Um, I do, I am very content and, and happy in the choices and decisions I've made. To get to serve here is a gift to have all of the friends and family support I have. I have a really good life. And I sat there in silence for about 15 seconds and I knew the answer. Um, and so I looked at Amy and I said, you know, I think sometimes it's hard living in the South, being a pastor, working at a church and to not have children. And she said, 
that, that's what you need to share. There are times where my family or over the years, a church member has asked the question, why don't you have children? There are events in our lives that Amy and I, we don't get invited to kids' birthday parties. And that can feel isolating. That can feel like we don't fit in with certain groups to be childless. I think of other groups that might walk into our church that have a similar experience. I think the hardest group of people to walk in a church are people that are single. Single people that have the courage and bravery to step foot on a church campus, to walk into a sanctuary, to walk into a modern worship space. They have so much courage, they do, because that is not easy. I name those things not to minimize the exclusion that people have felt based off their sexuality, their gender, their race. God knows any church I have ever walked into because of who I am, what I look like, who I represent, I have always been welcomed. I have never been excluded on that level. What I am naming is that exclusion, unfortunately, it is, it's a universal experience. We all at times can feel isolated, can feel like we don't belong, that we don't fit in, that we are excluded. This morning, I share those things with you all, um, not to minimize others' experiences, not to make you feel bad for me, but just name that exists in our world. And so I have a question as we wrap up this morning. My question is, when you look around our church family, who do you not see? Who do you see sitting by themselves? Or maybe a better question is, who do you absolutely not see? Who are we not including? Who do we need to include? Who are the Naomi's in the world that have had hardships, that are marginalized, that are on the lowest level in our societal structure, that need a Ruth, that need someone to go to them and say, I will not leave you. I am here. You are my person. I want you to experience a God of love. Who are those people standing on the outside, looking through the windows, of our beautiful stained glass, desperately looking in, wanting to be included. Who are they? You see, the, the challenge is not upon them. The challenge is upon us. Who are we called to go and to seek out? Who are we, go, who are we called to go and find? as the good shepherd did. Who is the one in the 99 that God is calling us to chase after, to run down, to find them and say, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And now you are my person. That's, that's who God is calling us to be. A God of all inclusive love that calls us to create an inclusive community that includes all. That's the good news of the story of Ruth. And that's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God, amen. I invite you to hear the words from our affirmation of faith this morning. At First Church, we are an open place for all to worship, grow, and serve. We believe you do not need to be anyone other than who you are. We believe that discrimination on the grounds of economic power, gender, mental health, physical ability, race, or sexuality is not reflective of Jesus's teachings. We believe in creating inclusive community. 
We acknowledge the ways many of us have felt excluded by the church, and we therefore strive to be a refuge of hope and compassion for all people. At First Church, we worship God, follow Jesus, and study scripture with a desire to bring forth the beloved community of God here on earth as it is in heaven. Friends and family, as you go out into the world, I want to call you back to Renee's piece of art, The Weaver. I only read excerpts from that because it was longer, but I want you to know that in the story that Renee wrote, the tapestry starts to fall apart. As the weaver's noticing that it's not holding tight, it's not staying together. She says this, the weaver breathes a prayer into each piece of yarn as she adds it back, reminding each strand that she has chosen them and that they are beautiful. The strands run back and forth. The weaver says you are more stunning than when you are next to those unlike you. You are all part of the whole. At the end, she sees what she's created. And she says, it was good. Friends, there are, there are people, there are Naomi's out in our world. They're looking through the window, wanting to be included. They are good. They are beautiful. It's upon us to find them, to seek them out and tell them that you're invited into this beautiful tapestry of people and we cannot be whole without you. That's the good news. Go in peace. <laughs>